Hi, this is Craig Stocks, and today I'm going to share a short uh, Photoshop technique that I use to turn short star trails in night sky photos into round stars. And this technique uses a, a combination of Photoshop techniques, which I would say are kind of intermediate level. Uh, we will be using layers and different blending modes, uh, also selections. And if you're comfortable using smart objects, that can make this process even more flexible because it gives you the opportunity to go back and iteratively change some of the settings to refine the, the look in the finished image. So why do we want to do this? Well, the goal when you're taking night sky photos is usually to get nice, sharp, round stars. And that can be hard to do if you're using a wide angle lens, it's a lot easier because the stars don't seem to move quite as, as fast because you're looking at a very wide section of the sky. So it's, wide angle lenses are more forgiving. If you're using a telephoto lens, especially a telescope such as an astronomer would use, it becomes much more challenging because you're magnifying the motion of the stars when you look through that telephoto lens. And here's just a comparison of what I'm talking about. On the left, you can see nice round stars. Uh, that photo was taken with a star tracking device, so the camera was moving with the apparent motion of the sky. On the right, you can see without using the tracking device that instead of round stars, <clears throat> we have little dashes or little lines or star trails. And that's what we want to try to fix in Photoshop. Now, there's some different ways of dealing with it. Uh, one way, of course, is just to embrace the idea of star trails and shoot star trails or star circles. And for some images, that's appropriate, uh, but that's usually not what you're after. You can use the 500 rule, and what that does is you calculate by dividing the focal length of the lens into 500, and the resulting number then gives you the maximum number of seconds before you have apparent star trails. So, for instance, for a 16 millimeter lens divided into 500, that would give you 31 seconds. A 50 millimeter lens would give you 10 seconds. 300 millimeter lens would give you 1.6 seconds. So you can see the longer the focal length, the shorter the exposure time you can use. And this is a kind of a rule of thumb, but it's not an exact. Uh, and generally, it will overstate the number of seconds that you can use. It does depend on the resolution of the lens and the resolution of the camera. Uh, basically, the lower resolution or the fuzzier the image, the less obvious the star trails will be. So if you're using a lower resolution camera, you may not have as much issues as if you're using a higher resolution sensor. Of course, another option is to use a, a tracking device, such as here, the Skywatcher is the brand, Star Adventurer is the model. And what that does is move the camera with the apparent motion of the sky. And that's a good solution in some situations, but it does add extra expense for the tracking mount. It adds extra equipment to haul with you, extra complexity in setting up, and of course extra processing because when you move the camera to compensate for the motion of the sky, you'll wind up with a fuzzy foreground. So then you have to photograph the foreground separately and blend that in Photoshop. So let's look at an example, and for the example we'll be using this photo of the uh, comet Neowice that I took a few days ago in the early morning hours. And this is the original, and though you can't really see it at this scale, the stars are actually little lines. And what I want to do is process this image into this image that brings the stars out a little more naturally. Just looking at it in a close-up, cropping in, this is a cropped view of the comet, and again, you can see the little star trails. This is the after image. So with that, let's jump over to Lightroom. And I generally do all of my initial processing in Lightroom. So here's the image with the basic processing done. Uh, so it's converted from raw, and all of the tone and color and contrast and so forth adjustments are done. Generally, I won't crop the image until the very end because I may change my mind on the aspect ratio that I need and an 8 by 10 versus an 11 by 14 are going to be slightly different aspect ratios. So from here, we'll just open this image in Photoshop and I do already have it open. 
So here's the resulting image in Photoshop, and all of the changes are in this layer group, which I can expand, and you can see the, the changes that I've made. And if I turn that layer group off, there we can see the, the before image. And when we zoom in, you can really see very distinctly that the stars were recorded as little lines rather than as points of light. And that was because of the, in this case, a 13 second exposure. So not a very long exposure, but still trails rather than dots. And what we want to do is turn these trails into dots. So to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is duplicate the background layer. And I'll do that with the keyboard shortcut Control J. And because this is a pretty high resolution file, I want to make these lines a little bit bigger. So I'm going to use filter other, and the filter I want is called maximum. And what the maximum filter does is it expands white areas or bright areas into dark areas. And I'm going to use about three pixel expansion and click OK. And this will take it a few minutes to process. But what it's doing is looking for bright areas and expanding bright areas into dark areas. And that's going to, in effect, make these little star trails a little bit fatter. And if I don't do this step first, then when I compress the lines into dots, they almost disappear. And I want to have a little meat in that star trail to work with. Depending on the resolution of your image, this may or may not be a necessary step. Now that I've made the stars a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger star trails, now we can turn these trails into dots. And to do that, I'm again going to dupl duplicate this layer, Control J again. And this time, I'm going to put the layer into darken blending mode. And you won't notice any change. And what darken blending mode does is it will compare for every pixel this layer to the pixel in the layer underneath it, and it will show the darker of the two. And the magic of this is if I activate the Move tool with the V key, and then move this top layer relative to the layer underneath it, the, basically the sky begins to overlay the trail and turns it back into a dot. And that's kind of the essence of this technique. Uh, you can adjust this up or down depending on how round you want them, uh, how big you want them. And that's why I made the star trails a little bit bigger to start with, is these would really start to just almost disappear if I didn't do this first. So now that we have that moved, and we have dots rather than stars, what I want to do is we'll take this a little bit further. I will combine these two layers, and so I'll select both layers, select one, shift click on the second one, and then control E, that would be command E on a Mac, to merge those two. And I think I want to make the stars a little bit larger, and I can do that with the opposite of the, the well, actually by using the same filter again, other, maximum. And this will make these stars just a little bit larger, a little bit more noticeable, and give a little bit more presence to them. And you can see why using uh, smart objects works really well, because if you get to this point and you decide that, wow, the, I should have made the streaks bigger or smaller or used the maximum filter larger the first time, a smart object lets you go back and change that without having to repeat all of the steps in between. Uh, of course, you could go back in history to that point, but then you'd have to redo every step since then. So now we have the stars, and what I want to do is fuzzy them up a little bit, because to me, they're just a little bit too sharp. So I will first, actually before I do that, I want to move them to their own layer. So I will go to Select, Color Range, and I have selected Highlights. And with the fuzziness, we can adjust which ones we want to select. And let's try that. 
And you can see in the preview that we're going to be selecting a lot that we don't want, and that's, that's kind of okay right now. So I'll just go ahead and click OK. And that selected the stars, and I want to expand that selection just a little bit to pick up a little bit of the sky around it. So I will go to Select, Modify, Expand, and we'll grow at about 5 pixels. That should be enough. Somewhere in the 5, 7, 8. Again, it depends on your resolution. Now, if I do a com Command or Control J to copy that to a new layer, what I've done is copy just those stars up to a new layer. And if I turn off this intermediate layer, you can see now we have the original layer showing everywhere except where we expanded the stars. Now I want to fuzzy up the stars just a little bit by adding a blur, Gaussian blur, and it doesn't take much. Uh, usually, you know, you know, maybe one or two pixels of blur will give it a natural look. And so now we have dots, in fact a little bit larger dots, rather than streaks. So there's a couple things we could do here. We can move, if I just grab the move tool again, I can move this and position those stars over the little streaks, and that hides a lot of them, but not all of them. So what I'm going to do is come down here, and I want to make a copy of the background. And I'm going to use the marquee tool and grab just the sky portion because we don't want to affect the foreground. I'll copy that again. And on this layer, I want to get rid of all the stars. Now, because we have the comet, uh, that's going to be a little bit of a problem. So I'm actually going to just take the comet out here all by itself using the the content-aware um, healing brush. Now, I'll blur this to the point that all the stars disappear. So I'll go again to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur, and we'll just adjust the radius of the blur until all the stars disappear. And it looks like somewhere around 50 pixels works. <clears throat> Now, one of the problems with that is that now it's too smooth, that if we look at the original, there's actually a little bit of noise, and we've eliminated all that noise. So I will come back and add a little bit of noise with the noise, add noise, and try to find an amount that is pretty close to what the original looked like. So. I'm guessing somewhere around 7%. And again, this is where having a smart object would let you go back and change that. Now when I turn the stars back on, we have the stars, but we don't have any of the streaks. And we do have the, <clears throat> still have the comet, but it's probably not as We've lost a little bit of that comet with this blur layer. So what I'll do is just add a, a layer mask and paint with black and add that comet back in. That You'll find that also adds back in. Uh, that may bring back some of the star trails. Oops. Let me grab the right tool. We want the brush tool. So if we look here at the before and after, the only problem we have now is we have a lot of stuff going on in the foreground that we don't want. And to get rid of that, I'll just group these into one group, all of our adjustments that we just made. Click the front loading washer icon to add a layer mask. Grab the brush tool and we'll just paint with black to 
paint all of that out with the mask so that we have the original layer there and we're basically done so we have we have effectively converted from little streaks that in fact were hard to see to more visible stars that are round rather than streaks that's the technique uh, if you have any questions let me know but I hope you enjoy it and I hope you have found this useful. Thanks and have a great day.